thank you and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, the Garfield County Libraries are presenting the third installation of our spring lecture series. With us today is the author of the upcoming book, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna, Alda P. Dobbs. She was born in a small town in Coahuila, Mexico, but moved to San Antonio, Texas as a child. Alda studied physics and worked as an engineer before pursuing her love of storytelling. She's as passionate about connecting children to their past, their communities, different cultures, and nature as she is about writing. Alda lives with her husband and two children outside of Houston, Texas. Well, thank you, Alex, for, for having me here. It's, it's an honor to be here. And I want to thank the, the Garfield County Libraries as well in uh, Glenwood Springs. And let me share my screen. All right, so my idea of this book came from, from stories that I heard by my, my great-grandmother and my grandmother about the Mexican Revolution. So it's Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna. And I'm gonna talk about it, about the ideas, about the people in the Mexican Revolution and how they migrated to the United States during that time. And like uh, Alex said, my name is Alda P. Dobbs. And again, it's a pleasure to be here. So we'll get started. And the inspiration, like I said, a lot of the stories that I learned during the, when I was a child came from my great grandmother who is here at the center. Her name was uh, Juanita Martinez. And this is my, my grandmother here. Her name was Josefa Diaz. And these two women, their stories from childhood were passed on to my mother who's over here. And that's me as a, as a kid. So all these stories always enrich my life. And many of these stories were of the poverty that they endured as children. So these were similar to the homes that my great-grandmother and my grandmother grew up in. You know, they used to call them chosas. And um, they were made out of a uh, thatched roof and adobe homes. And they always talked about the, the poverty they, they endured. They're very poor. Uh, they were also uh, illiterate, both my grandmother and my great-grandmother. And that was a big struggle. And it was common among, amongst the, the poor people. And, and also something, the stories that they shared was just the grueling work they, they both did as children. I heard stories of, as young as three years old, they started working. Some of the, the jobs included a herding sheep when they were, my grandmother started herding sheep when she was about three years old. And uh, she said even in the winter time, she was about three and a half when she remembers being in the mountain snow, just herding the sheep and trying to get them together before the storm came. And I can't imagine now putting my three and a half year old to work. Uh, during those conditions, but they had to back then. That, that was just the way life was. And another thing my great-grandmother, my grandmother did too, as children was to chop wood and sell it and deliver it. So the, the work was very grueling for these people and for the children. And uh, the other part of the stories too were the hunger. There's always hunger there. You know, there's always uh, droughts and uh, lack of money, lack of work, and just that fear of the uncertainty of the of the future, of what was to come. It was always surviving for for the day or for that week. You know, it's never you could never have enough plans for you know the way we do now that we plan for next year or whatnot. For them, it was just survival at the moment. So it's just the, the harsh realities that always mesmerize me how they survived that, how they endured that. And just the disparities too. Uh, these were similar homes, like I said, that my grandmother and great grandmother grew up in, in the conditions. And in my research of this book, I came across photographs uh, of these that like, resemble the homes that my family grew up in, as well as homes that look like these that show the, the haciendas, you know, just how the luxury these people lived in compared to what, you know, the extreme of the, of the poverty. They were on the other side of the pendulum, living in, in rich, uh, fulfilling lives. And 
as I continued to research on the Mexican Revolution for the book, I continue to come across these photographs, which show just the differences in the classes. And this one captured me because you see the women, how they're dressed in silks. And you see the, the nanny here who's caring for the, for the young infant. And uh, you see, the, <laughs> she looks exhausted to me, you know, the, the exhaustion here and, and just the, the women out here, you know, socializing. So even then you, you see that disparity. And another photograph that, that really captured me was this one here, that you see these four women dressed in silks and you see these two poor girls that would probably, that's the way my grandmother and great grandmother would be dressed. You see them walking opposite to these uh, four ladies in silks. And you see the contrast in their dresses. You see some are wearing the silks and some are wearing the ragged clothes. And the girls with the ragged clothes are barefooted and they're barefoot and they're carrying their, their baskets of goods. You know, they probably just sold something in the market or still selling. And again, you see that vast contrast in the way they're dressed and the way this lady is holding her skirt back and glancing at them. I was so impacted by this photograph that I actually, it inspired a scene in the book. So if you get to read my book, you'll, you'll see this, this scene actually that was inspired by this photograph. And of course, the, the name of the, the title of my book, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna, is because of the many bare feet I saw in the pictures and also of the stories my great grandmother and my grandmother shared. And even my grandmother, that people nowadays don't realize that, that shoes were a luxury and shoes are a luxury right now. We just take it for granted. And back then, you know, it didn't matter if it was icy, if it was snowing, if it was winter, shoes were a luxury so you can afford them and people did not wear them. And even while working in the story, when people ask me, okay, well, I don't get the bare feet, you know, why is she barefoot? And I said, well, that's the way it was. And people didn't believe that children would actually go through the winters without wearing any shoes. And I said, no, that the photographs are there. You know, there, there's some photographs I came across where you could see this, the icicles in the snow and the kids are barefoot. And like I said, that's just the way it is. And it was, and the things we take for granted now. So that's why I thought, okay, barefoot has to be somewhere in that, in the title. And other stories I also enjoyed about the, this time, this uh, difficult time in the Mexican Revolution was just the courage that people had to have to face these adversities. And the dream, especially the children, my great grandmother had the dream of learning to read and write. That was one of her biggest dreams. And of course, with the adversities that were happening around her, it was difficult to, to achieve that. And there were so many, uh, adversities in the society that ultimately that's what led to the Mexican Revolution when people were fed up, when people wanted more. They wanted land, liberty, they wanted justice and better working conditions and, and better living conditions, more opportunities. So those were stories too that were passed on to me about this. And uh, one story in this, I'm sorry, the Mexican Revolution actually changed the, the lives of everyone, especially women and children. It made them, for instance, uh, women, once the, the husbands joined the, re the revolucionarios, who were the rebels, they, they left with them. They joined them with kids and to the battlefields. They left and they would cook for them. They would uh, take care of them. It, and even when they fed them, there's a lot of stories that uh, they would cook the food for, for the soldiers, for the rebel soldiers. And while they went to the trenches to feed their husbands, as their husbands ate, they would grab the weapon and start fighting the enemy. So this is how dedicated these women were, and just brave. It, it amazes me, the stories. And after they were done feeding their husbands, they'd come back and take care of the children, do the laundry, and do everything they could in the camp, in the military camp, which didn't have the, the same uh, routines that they had at home. So everything was an adjustment, a constant adjustment, but they did it. They, they went through that knowing that it was a sacrifice because it was gonna be for a greater good. And likewise, you also had families that were with the federales and a lot of them were forced 
conscripted into the Federales. And a lot of women ended up going with them as well, so they wouldn't stay alone in the in the villages and along with the children too. Some women, these are the trains that they used to ride. And again, a lot of people, it's hard for them to imagine that these families lived on top of the train and traveled and cooked. And some women, there's uh, records of women giving uh, childbirth on top of those trains as well. So it was a different life, but like I said, the mentality was that they, they wanted to fight to make a, a better Mexico. And a lot of the women and children joined the, the rebels. If they weren't forced conscripted into the Federales, they joined the rebels. And children as young as 12 would join the, the rebels. And they were, once they joined, they were accepted as one of their own. They didn't see the, that child as a child anymore. They were one of their rebel soldiers, fellow rebel soldiers. So they were treated, they were trained. A lot of them were trained as spies. Since there were children, it was easier for them to go to the enemy lines and blend in, gather intelligence, excuse me, <clears throat> and come back and report what they had found out. And same thing with the women. A lot of them were spies as well. And the sad part, <clears throat> excuse me, the sad part about the children were the ones that were forced into the federales. They were conscripted. There was many of them that where where the federales would raid orphanages and pull out the kids and some of them were as young as six years old and they would put uniforms on them and make them fight so that was a really sad part that i read about the the force of conscription of children in the revolution but a lot of them were like my great-grandmother that they were too young too weak to fight so they fled, they escaped the, the revolution. They escaped the violence that was uh, surrounding them, the burning of their villages. And my great grandmother was one of them. She escaped the, her village and they lived in the mountains in the middle of Coahuila and they had to walk across the desert. They trekked the desert and it took them days to get there and there was uh, a lot of stuff that they went through, there was, you know, of course, you had the, the elements of the desert, the lack of food, and whatever little bit of food was that the desert provided, it was all gone because so many people were, were fleeing. So it, it got pretty, uh, according to her, it was pretty desperate, the, the situation. And uh, so this is where my great grandmother started. Like I said, she was in the middle of Coahuila near the mountains, and she trekked towards Texas, towards uh, Eco Pass, Texas. The name of the town in Mexico was called Piedras Negras and it borders with Eco Pass. Now, like many, I'm sure many of you have uh, stories from your family too about the, the Mexican revolution of how your ancestors came here into America. My great grandmother's story was that she got to this bridge at Eco Pass. And she said she was trying to cross a bridge, but they wouldn't let her in, her and her family. She said it was hundreds of people trying to get across and the US government has shut it down and said, no, you can't come in. And they were fleeing the federales. So they waited patiently, hoping, hoping the bridge would open. And after three days of waiting, the federales finally showed up to Piedras Negras. And she said when they saw them, especially when they started wheeling their cannons, and pointed them at the crowd. At the crowd, they said it was chaotic. It was chaos, and and people started screaming and just running for the bridge. And she said it was uh, people begging for their lives and asking the the soldiers because it was U.S. Army soldiers who were guarding the the gates of the bridge. They were begging them to open it and whatnot. And when they heard the cavalry of the federal federales coming down, that's when people started really, really pleading for their lives. And at that moment, my great grandmother says she was there and she doesn't know what happened or why, but that the, the uh, American soldiers came over and opened the gates and everybody just flooded in and into America. And she said it was hundreds of people. So, and she, this is one of her favorite stories. She would tell this story over and over. And then my grandmother started saying it over and over as well. And always with that same enthusiasm. So I always wondered about it, if it was true or not. 
So I set out, I said, you know what, I'm going to find out if this story is true or not, or there's something that was, you know, how some stories with time, this truth gets stretched and you wonder if it was real or not. So I said, okay, I'm going to start researching this story. And I started reading books on the Mexican Revolution. And I read books in Spanish, books in English, and really good books that I, I learned so much about the Mexican Revolution in terms of the government, why the causes, um, who was, what leaders in, uh, in Mexico or abroad were involved. But I found nothing about that one incident. And, uh, and I said, I've read about 40 books and all, and I could not find anything. So I started getting frustrated because I, I had these questions or I had these answers to these questions. I knew it was about my great grandmother and her family and hundreds of other refugees. I knew that they had crossed the, the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo, as they used to call it. It was an Eagle Pass and they were escaping the Federales and that they had ran for their lives. I don't know when it had happened, but none of those details appeared in any of these books. And it was during the time I was in Colorado too. I was living in Colorado Springs and the librarian in, uh, in Pikes Peaks, uh, Pike Peaks uh, library system, he's the one that led me to this called the Portal of Texas History. And in it, I was able to read newspapers from the past. So it, it was, to me, it was like a time machine. I felt like, okay, finally I could travel back to the past and relive those moments day to day and find out if this really happened or not. And what I learned, it was incredible. So to backtrack, remember, like I said, I had those questions answered except for the date. So I told myself, okay, out of all the research I had done before, I came up with this date, November 20th, 1910. And that's the official start of the Mexican revolution. So I said, okay, I will start with that day because it, it had to happen after that. So I began with that date. And I read every single newspaper that was printed out after that date in Texas. So it took me about six, seven months of reading many, many newspapers. I'd say probably over three, 400 paper newspapers until I came across this headline that it said, fearful scenes enacted in flight of refugees from Piedras Negras. And that was it. That was the event that my great grandmother had had lived through, and uh, everything was exactly how she had described it. Except she said it was hundreds of people, and it was actually thousands. It was about almost seven thousand people. So once I found out this article, or found this article here, I knew that the date was October fifth, nineteen thirteen. And that was easier. Once I had that date, it was easier to do research of that particular date. And once I did that, I could find archives of photographs uh, that occurred during that date. And I ended up finding this picture here, which I thought was just amazing uh, because it shows that event. And at, over here, you see that tower, that city hall in Piedras Negras. This is the bridge, the International Bridge. And these are all the people, the refugees that are running for their lives. So somewhere among that crowd is my great grandmother. So it nearly brought me to tears when I saw this photograph. And had I had not had that date, I would have probably never found this photograph. So just the, the, the research that goes involved, that's involved in this, just the, the, the outcome that the, I call them like gold nuggets that you find just because it's so valuable. And, these are photographs that my grandmother never saw or my great grandma, but I feel so blessed to, to be looking at, to be able to see this. And once I had that, yes, like I said, the, the research became easier. So the, the story continues for a lot of the refugees. And uh, I have my book, which shows Petra Luna's uh, coming from, from Mexico. And I also have a book too, that's following up, that's coming out next year. And that one shows her in the refugee camps because my great grandmother stayed in one of them in Piedras Negras. But these refugee camps were throughout the Southwest border. There were some in uh, Presidio, 
and there's some over and uh, they had one in Fort Bliss too, a, a really, really big one. They had some in Arizona and they had some in New Mexico as well. So these were, because there were so many people trying to cross over. So they started, uh, there was a fear of smallpox that were that was coming. A lot of the times, like the one in Fort Bliss, there were federales that were actually escaping. Uh, they were about to get defeated by, by the rebels, by Pancho Villa. So they ended up crossing the border and just escaping because you got to think about these federales. A lot of them didn't want to be there. A lot of them had been forced to, to enter the, the federales. So when they had the opportunity to escape, you know, they, they left. So they were interned in Fort Bliss just out of caution too, because they didn't know if they were going to uprise and try to gain weapons and go back and fight. So they, they kept them and turned there. And uh, the other ones were more of the refugees, just the people trying to escape both. But everybody, you know, they, they wanted to take paperwork, take names, you know, make sure they documented everyone. And it wasn't like today where, you know, it's a lot easier to keep track of things. Back then, you know, they had a lot of stuff. We don't have, they didn't have the technology that we have now. So it's a lot difficult. And that's another thing I, with my research. I, um, you always hear about ancestry.com. And I, I went into that website, signed up with the, the, the trial, and I couldn't find any records of that date. And it's just because of the chaos that happened. You know, they didn't write any of the names. It was just, they let everybody run through that bridge. And they didn't, you know, nobody had time to sit down and write all 7,000 names. So there's no record of it. So I, I was interested, you know, whether I would find my, my great grandmother's name in any book. And I'm still searching. Maybe it is out there. But so far, I haven't had any luck with it. I had more luck with the, with the newspapers than I did with that website. So you know, FYI. But um, so yeah, a lot of the refugees uh, stayed in those camps. <coughs> Excuse me. And something that happened too, is that um, once they were in those camps, once they were going to shut those camps down, they gave refugees the option to either go back to Mexico, return to Mexico, or stay in the US, and they would be offered work. There were many jobs available and contractors would go to these refugee camps and hire these uh, refugees. The contractors were from either the railroad uh, system, they're from meat packing plants, they're from agriculture. And because there were so many uh, jobs that were needed, especially in, in uh, agricultural, because uh, they, they had this big harvest and not enough hands working the, the land. So they were desperate for, for labor excuse me, and, uh, and they went to these uh, camps to hire the people. So that's how a lot of that, that first wave, <coughs> excuse me, of immigrants settled in the United States. And once that settled, these settlements happened, these communities happened throughout the, the Southwest, that's when the sub subsequent waves of uh, Mexican migrants started coming. <coughs> And my, uh, my great grandmother was one of the families that decided to return to Mexico. Uh, I remember she said her and her dad and her cousins spoke about it and, and debated whether they should stay in the United States, accept the work or go back. And she said that her father had said, you know what, Mexico's our country. It's our responsibility to bring her back and make her better. So he said, no, we're going back. And uh, so they all decided to go back. And when I did this research, I thought to myself, okay, what if she had decided to stay? You know, what if her dad had said, you know what? No, let's just see what's out here. So that's what book two for me was. It was that what if my family had decided to pursue that American dream? And my research continued. Okay, what was it like for this Mexican refugee to come into a new new place, a new language, a new culture, what would they face? What would they, what adversities, what new adversities would they confront? And so it was interesting to go and, and read narrations from people who lived during that time, newspaper articles, and see the photographs of these new people. And a lot of them 
because I'm from San Antonio and I did the research about San Antonio. So that's where it follows up. Book two in San Antonio and in many other places like El Paso and uh, places like New Mexico too. And even in Colorado, I noticed Trinidad, uh, Trinidad had a, a Mexican sector segment and they called it Little Mexico because that's where Mexicans would settle. In San Antonio, they called Little Mexico Los Corrales too, and they had little little houses there. And San Antonio now, the West Side, that's it changed the whole dynamic of San Antonio now, ever since that settlement happened. And just like many other cities in the Southwest and the entire Southwest too, pretty much changed, like I said, from that first wave of immigrants. And one of the research I started doing for this presentation was for the, I, Kind of like the Texas portal where you see these old newspapers or well, Colorado has one too and it's the Colorado historic newspapers collection which to me again it was like a time machine that took me back then and uh, I saw several uh, reports about what had happened with uh, Mexican refugees and the ones that, that captured my imagination were this one here uh, where it says it happened in Trinidad, it says more than 100 Mexican refugees, poorly clad and almost starved, reached here from the war zone, flooded the employment offices and in their native languages begged to be given work. Some were deserters of the army of General Huerta, others were rebels. All were tired of fighting. Some told pitiful stories of going for days without food and tramping for miles to get to the American side of the line. So, and this is in Colorado and we heard the same thing, you know, in Texas, we hear the same thing in California. So these were, that was a common factor. They were tired of fighting. They just wanted stability in their life. They wanted work and their hope was that America could offer that to them. So when I saw this, you know, again, I'm almost brought to tears because it's, it's so common for everybody. And the other one I read here was about the discovery. It says that they discovered uh, casks of dynamite. And it turns out that they were being buried and they think they were being buried by Mexican refugees who were probably had ties with the, with the rebels and were trying to save these dynamites to smuggle them back into Mexico. And of course they got arrested, you know, because they broke the law about, you know, trying to help ate the other side while they're in American soil, but just you know, the desperation of trying to help the other side and, and how much America was involved in, in, that, uh, in that war as well, you know, with its people and with the people coming over. So America was affected, you know, with, by this war and the face of America was changed forever by this war, even though it was a Mexican revolution, it was over a million people 2 million people, as a matter of fact, that moved over here. So that, that'll change the country forever when you have 2 million migrants moving over. And, and it's just upsetting that, that no, more books don't share the story or don't highlight these events of the Mexican Revolution. And the reason I, it's upsetting sometimes is because of the echoes of history because history tends to repeat itself. So these are pictures that I saw of the Mexican Revolution of people, like I said, they're escaping their, the violence in their homeland. And these are pictures I saw two months ago. And you put them side by side and you're like, oh my goodness, you know, it's happening again. You, you see the same thing happening. And then I saw this picture, of course, it's another one that I found out from my great grandmother's time that when she was crossing the bridge and you see the same border, you know, a hundred and uh, what is it? 120, 110 years later. And here it is happening again. And the refugee camps, like the one my great grandmother was in, and this was back in 1913. And you have that now, same thing. And the funny thing is that back then too, you had the, the smallpox scares, you know, with people being afraid of getting smallpox and then people trying to find a vaccination, trying to va 
vaccinate the, the refugees. And of course you have COVID-19 now with the refugees. And again, this one picture representing those vests and uh, you know that gap, that social divide, and you see that now as well. Not only here in the United States, but all over the world, you see that too. And and we got to teach kids that you know this is something that ultimately led to a revolution because people were just fed up with with that poverty, that uh, unjust treatment, and you know it makes you wonder what's going to happen now with these extreme social economic uh, gaps. And, but we also have to realize the, the spirit of giving. So back in, in, during the Mexican revolution in the refugees coming over, the Red Cross and many charities got together to feed the refugees. And, and it's nice to see how many uh, fundraisers there were and in the papers, they, they were advertised in the newspapers they, that they're gonna have a parade to raise funds and they're gonna have, uh, one of them was a parade of cars. So they asked people to bring their, their cars. And if you wanted to participate in the parade, you had to pay a, a fee, but that fee wasn't going to go to raise funds for the refugees. And, uh, and they did that parade to the kids that were the refugees so that the kids could look at the cars. And so it's a pretty neat, neat uh, thing that I, I had to put into the book too as well. But you see that same spirit of giving in the South right now like in, uh, in the Valley, you see that with uh, this nun here, Sister Pimentel, she's a wonderful lady who's been her and along with many, many others throughout the, the Southwest are helping these res refugees right now. So we got to tell these children about these histories and how they tend to repeat themselves, but also that there's hope and they have it in their power to make change. So if you go to my website, I have uh, resources and guides that explain the Rex Mexican Revolution. I have a, a video that shows the, uh, the, the books that I researched. And I also have a, a playlist of songs that I just added this week. And the play playlist of songs have all the songs from the, that were popular during the Mexican Revolution so that people could, could get a feeling of what it was like during Mexico and what inspired a lot of that music and the sentiment when they wrote the lyrics to that music that was happening at the time, the turmoil. And I'm also working on two videos uh, for children that one of them is going to explain the Mexican revolution to, to children. And it, it should be good for adults as well. But, and then the other one's going to explain the role of children in the Mexican revolution, whether they had joined the rebels or whether they were forced conscripted to the, the federales. So I should have that in the next couple of months. And also in my uh, website, I have a, a contact uh, button there where you could reach out to me if you have any questions about the Mexican Revolution or about researching family stories. I, I love all kinds of family stories, especially if they're about uh, coming into America as migrants and all that. It always inspires me because uh, I think in, in a lot of these stories, we find strength and that's something we got to find in these uh, old family stories and be able to share them and also research and investigate them just because they're going to be lost one day. You know, these once these stories, these people that have these stories, they, when they pass or they die, they're gone. That's it. We don't we don't have access to that story or that information anymore. So we got to get out there and gather these stories and pass them to the next generation to strengthen them. And uh, so, yeah, I have a contact information there. Any questions on Mexican Revolution, on uh, researching family stories, please feel free. You know, I'm happy to answer anything. And uh, my website is written down here. It's uh, www.aldapdops.com. And I thank you very much for, for listening to me uh, under this presentation here. So. I'm going to stop sharing screen and there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alda. It's, it's amazing to see somebody with, you know, so much passion for history. Um, you know, I, I, I kept thinking towards the end there when you mentioning, when you were mentioning a couple of times that history repeats, uh, repeats itself. And 
you know, I wanted to go a little bit more into that when you're looking at those. And that was a great kind of strategy you had to, to look at those pictures side by side, you know, 100 years difference. And, you know, things in the last 10, 15 years, you know, when it comes to this immigrant crisis, as they call it, uh, you tend to get into a lot of messy politics about it. And there's, you know, renewed outrage and some people that make it sound like it's either never happened before, you know, I don't know. How does that make you feel like looking at it, repeating itself? Uh, if you can go a little bit deeper into, you know, those feelings that you get when you see a hundred years ago, these families were going through the same thing and now they're going through it again and it's different people. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's upsetting. It's upsetting because it's, it's a trend that, that happens. You know, you see it with, the, with different waves of immigration and you see it coming and, and then you could see that it's going to get bigger. You know, things are getting worse around the, the globe in terms of economies and whatnot. And you see it coming and, and then when it gets here, it's like, no, well, where did it come from? It's like, well, yeah, it, it's been, you know, it happened a hundred years ago and you see little waves coming, you know, so it, it's bound to repeat itself. So the fact that I would say just preparedness or maybe it is denial or not of the awareness. So that's why I'm like, okay, at this point, we got to start teaching this generation that, no, it, it happens, you know, these little ones that we're teaching now in 20 years from now, they're going to be running the world. So we got to prepare them and let them know, you know, so it's now as a grown up, I feel that responsibility that, okay, now, since we're not, you know, we see the, the crisis going on right now and we're trying our best to get it fixed. But hopefully the next generation will do a lot better to, to be helping that situation. Yeah, and, you know, perhaps one of the best ways to tell the story or, or teach people about it is by writing, uh, you know, books like Barefoot Dreams. Um, I mean, I, I understand it, why you went into the topic, and it's fascinating, and it's, it's a big, important part of, of human history. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you to give me a little bit more background into the inspiration of writing the story like you wrote it. Yeah, at first it's funny because I'm, I'm writing for children and um, I had this one book that, uh, that, that has a bit of, of culture and whatnot, but it wasn't selling. So, and I was learning how to write. So I said, okay, I'm gonna put it away and, and I'm gonna write children's articles for Highlights Magazine. So I started writing one and I started writing about my great grandmother. And, and that's when I said, okay, did it really happen? Did it not happen? And uh, so I did the whole investigation, found that that it really happened. So I said, okay, I'm gonna make it a children's article and, and publish it with Highlights Magazine. And as I wrote, I said, no, this has to be more than a children's magazine article. This has to be a book where I could, you know, hopefully get more awareness about this topic. And so I wrote a picture book and it was one scene that in the refugee camp that my great grandmother had lived in. And I remember I took it to a conference and um, the lady saw it, this one agent, and I gave her the whole manuscript for the picture book and she read the, the manuscript and she said, well, can I see the rest of it? And I said, well, you, you're holding the whole thing. I said, that's it, it's a picture book. And she said, oh, I, I thought it was a novel. And she said, I thought this was just a chapter. I thought there was, and she said, no, 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 you have to, you have to write a book of this. You know, I want to know what happens before. Why did the character end up in the refugee camp and, and where does she go afterwards? And that's when I started scratching my hand and said, you know what, she's right. You know, there's more to this story that I got to tell. So I knew my grandmother's, my great grandmother's background about why she ended up in the refugee. So I said, well, yeah, let me expand on that. Let me research why, you know, she had to leave her village and and in reading more about the revolution, that's when I read all these heartbreaking stories of people being forced to leave or, or being, like I said, conscripted into the, the federales and stuff like that. So, you know, I added a lot of that into the story. And so it was basically, I wanted to speak for, for all these people, for all that suffering 
with this novel, with this book. So a lot of it was inspired by my great grandmother, but a lot of it, I wanted to give those people a voice that to this point, I, I, I get people telling me I never knew, you know, so much about the Mexican revolution. You know, I have never seen a book for children like this. So that's when I really get motivated. I'm like, okay, I gotta do this. You know, I, I wanna teach these kids how, how we got here to, at least with myself, you know, how we got here to America. Yeah, and I'm very much looking forward to the book coming out. Can you tell me again when it's coming out? Yes, it's September 14th. Uh, it's a Tuesday. I was hoping it'd be September 16th, but <laughs> they wouldn't do it. So mm -hmm. I want to get Yeah, but uh, September 14th is when it's coming out. Oh. Yeah, and then book, book two will be, like I said, book two follows Petra Luna at the refugee camp and beyond. That'll be next year that it comes out. And see, and I was going to ask you about that. That that's very interesting. So you based this first book on real uh, events that happened in your grandmother's childhood. And did you say that you know your family decided to go back to Mexico? So after that point, for the second book, it's more fictionalized. It's what would have happened if they would have stayed. Can you? Go a little bit deeper into why you decided to continue that story. It's kind of like an alternative history of your family, right? Um, yeah. And you know, if you have uh, any ideas, I don't know if you can say or anything, but any ideas of the title of that second book? You don't have to say it if, if you don't want <laughs> to, but I'm, I'm very curious. No, I don't have any ideas for the title. So if anybody has an idea, send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I keep wanting to use the word bear, but I'm like, no, nope, I used it already. Think of something else, you know. But I know a lot of it was, I, I guess I, a little bit of a selfish reason was because I was an immigrant myself to this country. I, I came, I was born in Mexico and I came here. And even though I came here as a young child, I didn't learn English until I was in school. So for me, it was the first introduction to the American culture, the language being in school and trying to learn English. And at first, the neighborhood I grew up with, and it was all Mexican, and everybody spoke Spanish. So my world started opening up, you know, not until I was in middle school, were there other students from other races. So I wanted a character that had been exposed to that level of uh, differences and whatnot as she grew up. So I, I experimented with that, and I started reading uh, newspapers of... Uh, how the Mexican refugees interacted with uh, the Irish that were in San Antonio, with the Germans that were there, with the Asians, and just how this culture, I mean, San Antonio right now seems very Mexican uh, with its fiesta week and whatnot, but it's a very, it's a mesh of many cultures in San Antonio. So I wanted to put my, my character in the middle of that, you know, and see how she fared, you know, kind of throw her in there and say, okay, what are you, what are you gonna do now? <laughs> so. That's interesting. And then, you know, the reason why I'm so curious about the title for the second, because I, I love the title for this first book. Oh. Uh, I think there's a lot in, you know, uh, with the economy of words of this title, there's a lot packed in there. Mm -hmm. And it, it does ring of children, mm -hmm. that term barefoot. And, and you explained a little bit of that in your presentation. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to take that in. I think that the history of children and, and women is often overlooked. It, did that come into your line of thought when you were writing? Because I, I imagine that the characters, the, the story is heavily based on, on women and children and you know their part in the immigration. Because everybody you know, talks about the men, they go off to work. It, it's kind of like, the only narrative about immigration is, you know, the working. And for most of history, it's, it's been the men. So that those stories of women and children are often ignored. And I, I think it's nice that you're bringing that up. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? You know, why you wanted those stories to be told? Yes, and you're right for those reasons, because they always seem to get overlooked. And um, especially kids, you know, you, they don't seem to have a voice when it comes to war. They always talk about the men and how they were forced to join or, or they joined the rebels or, and and even fiction i've noticed too like uh the underdogs by uh yeah the which are called the los de abajo it's also about men and a lot of them 
fiction or nonfiction, it's all about the men. And, and then there's some about women, soldaderas, you know, and stuff like that, not as many. But then the children, it, it was hard to find narratives or books or uh, things that describe what children went through. There's a couple of them. Uh, one of them was Barrio Boy by Ernesto. Uh, yeah, he's, I think it's Lenguardia Lanzora. I can't remember his last name, but uh, it starts with an L. But he, my goodness, his book is nonfiction. And he, Barrio Boy tells about how he grew up in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution. And then he actually moved to the United States. So I, I've read that book, it's, it's fascinating. And uh, I think it's Arzuela, Ernesto Arzuela. But um, he, yeah, I followed him. And then there's another one with a girl. And, but these stories uh, are geared or written with an adult reader in mind. So I wanted something that had the child, but geared towards the child as well, so that the child could identify with that character and feel what the, what the character had gone through. And that, child world like interesting mm -hmm. and you know i before today i didn't know there was a second book coming so <laughs> i was going to ask you about that too if you planned on on following this story and now I'm, I'm thinking are you planning to make this into a longer series i know it's a little bit early but do you imagine this becoming more than two books um i don't know at least for petra luna i i Honestly, I have a lot of ideas in my head now. If people listen to me, that's a different thing, you know. But I, I do uh, get thoughts because uh, a lot of people that came here as children during the Mexican Revolution, I've also followed up because World War I happened, you know, four years later. And how did that affect them? Because some of them, you know, were citizens already because a lot of Mexicans came here during the Mexican Revolution. And the process was that you were here for one year and you could apply for citizenship. So a lot of them ended up getting their citizenship right away after a year. And after that, they could join the military, you know? So I read a couple of anecdotes of them actually joining World War I. So then I thought to myself, okay, you know, what if a boy came here and, and did that, you know, came from one war and then joined another one for another country, how would that work? So all these ideas go through my head and, and then one of the characters too in book one, uh, she's a, a rebel fighting soldier, soldadera or soldado. And so a lot of people always, when they read that book, they're like, oh, I love my, her name is Marietta <laughs> too. So yeah, I love Marietta. You should write a follow-up about her. You know, we want to know more about her. So, eh, you know, it's something in my head too, but who knows? Like I said, one thing is for me to have the idea, the other thing is for the publisher said, yeah, you know, we'll do something about it. Good. Um, and I wonder if maybe one day you visited on a picture book, like your original idea. Uh, yeah. Back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I imagine, what, what are the ages that you're kind of imagining this book is geared or this now series is geared towards? I'm thinking uh, the, the publisher says uh, nine to twelve, but my well, my daughter just turned nine, but uh, so I guess she's nine already. So, but she read it and she loved it and she liked it, and her uh, friend who's eight read it. So I'm like, okay, and she got it, understood it. So I figured, okay, maybe eight. I mean, there it is war book. You know, there's violence in there and whatnot. So you know, you keep that in mind and use your discretion. But I've had a uh, teachers tell me that they would like to teach it for their high school students that they feel that they would understand even though it's from the perspective of a 12 year old just the way she observes the world and the way she, you know they're trying to recruit her to become one of the rebels and so they're like no this, this is something that a high school kid could um, easily you know uh, kind of identify with as well you know as a, as a female soldier that's fighting who's young and I've had adults too say that they it was easy for them to follow the the complexities of the Mexican Revolution because I, I guess I broke them down and try to explain it to a you know to a girl so hopefully you know that that helps and I could capture a wider audience so that's that's my intent just to spread that word about you know what really happened you know from the child's perspective uh from that child who's running away from the war you know how they saw the war right uh, I think it's a great material for a youth book club. And oh, 
I, I, I'd like to say that, you know, once the book comes out, you know, in the fall in September, that we are hoping as a library to host it as a book club for you. So that is oh. that is coming at the end of this year. Very exciting. Oh, no, thank you. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> With that in mind, uh, my last question for the night is, what do you hope readers are taking from the story? Uh, you went a little bit into it, but you know, seeing as, you know, the, the United States is a country of, of immigrants. We, we all know that. And, all the history is based upon the movements of immigrants. So what do you hope people take away when they read this? My, my biggest hope is that just to see the similarities, how we're all connected, how, like you said, this country is built of so many immigrants and whether you're from, you know, Eastern you know, uh, Europe or Irish descent or from Africa or, you know, how we have those adversities and we have those trials when we come to this country trying to adapt trying to assimilate and and how everybody a lot of people suffered i you know you read from the irish family famine how they had to run from that and uh recently i went to uh, a museum here in fredericksburg texas and read about the the germans how they came here trying to find land and whatnot and they were left in galveston with nothing, without a cent. And they, they had been promised to be taken to Central Texas and they just pretty much left them there in the coast and all of them perished, you know, it's just that suffering of, you know, how we have all that in common to come here and try to make this country, you know, try to make the American dream happen. So I'm hoping that's what they'll take away from that book, how, how much we all have in common. Yeah, I hope so too. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. I could, I think I can go for another hour or two, but <laughs> we do have to go home. Uh, I just wanted to thank you so much for going over, you know, all that research you did. I, I think family histories are extremely important to understanding history as a whole because everything happens, you know, at the most basic level as a family unit. So going through these stories and finding, uh, you know, if you have a chance to look through your own family's historical photos and all of that, it's it's amazing. So mm -hmm. I think you kind of gave that a little bit of light and I, I'm really looking forward to the book coming out this fall. Oh, no, well, thank you, it was an honor. You know, like I said, if there's anything, you know, I could answer any of your patrons' questions or something like that, I'm, I'm honored. I'm always happy to be here. Well, thank you so much and with that, we had Alda P. Dobbs with us tonight. We are looking forward to the release of Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna, which is coming out September, what was the date, 14th? 14th. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Alda. Thank you, and have a great night. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.